The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Monday, December 1st, 2014. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship Questions and Answers Time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker, Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Monday Night Question and Answer Program. Tonight, we're going to look at the Bible with any questions or comments that anyone may have, and each person is invited to share what's ever on your mind by contacting us in one of the ways that were mentioned, and we'll be glad to take your call. And I'll try to respond as much as possible by going to the Bible, as the Bible is God's holy word. Well, uh, we have a short time together. So, we're going to begin uh, by going to the first person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please, go ahead with your call. Uh, hi, Chris. Thanks for taking my call. I just have two questions, if I may. One being, um, I heard you mentioning uh, about Israel when they were uh, on the verge of leaving, uh, in a position to leave Egypt. Do you think at this point that that's kind of like where we are? Because one, like you said, these plagues that God uh, brought upon Egypt, the Israelites, it never it never bothered them, and they weren't touched by it. And uh, so I guess it, to some degree, are we kind of like waiting for the exodus? Well, um, you know, some of the pictures that God uses in plaguing Egypt um, – they they are pictures of Judgment Day, like the death of the firstborn. But um, really, the big tie-in with our time is the coming out of Egypt uh, after Pharaoh has been plagued and he lets the people go finally. And then all the Jews come out of Egypt. And the Jews spiritually represent the elect, and Pharaoh, Satan, who was trying his best to keep the captives. And, and just as um, Satan tried his best to keep those predestinated souls in darkness, and that's what the spiritual battle down through time was about, God ransacking the kingdom of Satan and translating these people out of darkness and into the light. Well, now finally, all of Israel, every every Jew, not one was left in Egypt. It wasn't ninety nine percent of the Israelite slaves, but every last one of them, old, young, and in between, and they all came out of Egypt in a great deliverance. And, and that would relate to the completion of God's salvation program. And, and that's where the tie-in to May 21, 2011 comes in, because God saved the last spiritual Jew uh, by that time. And, and, and so it was as though all Israel now was delivered from the clutches of Satan. And, and we have another similarity, because just as the Jews were finally freed, and while they were uh, slaves in Egypt, I'm sure all they could think about was just going through those gates, free men and women. And, and uh, th that would be tremendous and, and wonderful and a great blessing and everyone would rejoice. And, and that's exactly what did happen, but it wasn't long after going through those gates that they were severely tried and tested for the next 40 years. And likewise, everyone looked ahead to May 21, 2011, 
the completion of God's salvation, and we thought it'll be the great day of deliverance in the rapture, but we were incorrect about what lie on the other side of of the gate, uh, to put it in, in a figure, we were incorrect about God's plan. The, the Jews did not immediately go into the promised land of Canaan after they were delivered out of Egypt, but God had um, other plans for them. He took them on a roundabout route, a elongated route, as long as you can, you could probably get 40 years to get to the land of Canaan. And he did the similar thing. He did not take his people immediately to heaven, but he is testing us in all likelihood over 1600 days to weed out the murmurers and complainers just as as there were amongst the Israelites. Okay, thank you for that. And my second question, if I may, is um, you were talking about uh, hell being a condition, and I just wanted to ask additional question. Um, are you saying that, because if hell is a condition, and I think you said the condition was no more salvation, there's no more hope for those who are not believers, who are not elect, because the door has been shut. Therefore, I think you are saying that at this time, the unbelievers are in hell? Yes, but not in hell a place, even though the world is a place, but it's a condition. The condition of the fallen angels was they were held in chains of darkness. And for them, what that meant was that there was no possibility of salvation. God made no provision for any of the fallen angels to save them. And, and that was the darkness. And, and again, uh, look up the word dark or darkness and see how often it's used in connection with death. And, and remember, death and hell are synonymous. The, the word hell is sometimes translated as grave. So hell means the grave or death. And God, in shutting the door of heaven on May 21, 2011, brought mankind into a condition of hell. He guaranteed their death. And, and the spiritual darkness it, it's just a representation of that. Man now is held in chains of darkness throughout this period of time, and, and then uh, will be the last day when he is finally completely destroyed. Uh, thank you. Good night. You're welcome. Thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Monday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hello, Chris. Uh, in light of it being a uh, Christmas season and which we observe the coming of the uh, Messiah, the promised Messiah, uh, let's look at Luke 2, verse 6. Luke chapter 2 and verse 6. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Okay, we know that uh, Mary here is um, representing the bride of Christ already elect. And notice what it says there, the way God has his word, that not that she would deliver, but that she should be delivered. And there God is telling us that Mary, representing all believers, are going to be delivered from being under the wrath of God because the Messiah is now here and he will surely be going to the cross and atoning for their sins. So I just find well, that uh, well, that uh, that now, um, she should be delivered. Now, uh, later on, there's a statement made to Mary that, yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own heart also, indicating that it was God's plan to save her. She was one of, one of the elect and, and the child she would give birth to, Messiah, 
um, eternal God in the flesh would save her as well as save uh, the rest of the elect all throughout time, but uh, uh, he, he had already saved people in the past before being born. So that it's not his action of entering into the world and going to the cross uh, that is providing that salvation, that, that's showing forth, it's demonstrating the salvation. But Noah was saved, and David and Abraham, long before Christ made these things manifest and went to the cross. So, uh, you know, we can't read too much into that statement here in Luke 2, verse 6. But that's because they're not saved by any action that God took before the foundation of the world. But Israel was saved because, look at Romans 3.25. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And there's the explanation of why and how all believers prior to the cross were allowed into heaven by God, because by his forbearance and his knowing the end from the beginning, he knew Christ was going to go to the cross and pay for their sins, and in that way... They no, 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 you, you, you still are missing it. Now, God says there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. Remember in Hebrews in Hebrews 9.22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And that means blood had to first be shed in order for there to be remission of sins. Now, now God is making this statement in, in the midst of speaking of the sacrifices that pointed to Christ. But it was Christ's blood shed from the foundation of the world that provided the grace and mercy and, and the gospel that saved people like Abel and Noah and, and Abraham and so forth. And, uh, and he had already died, already risen and was justified, and, and therefore the gospel was prepared. The works of Christ for all of his elect were finished, Hebrews 4.3 tells us, from the foundation of the world. The works, not the principle, not the theory, the theoretical uh, idea, but the very works. Look up that word works. It, it has to do with action, with, with the doing of something. And the very works were finished before the world even began. Well, thank you for calling. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Monday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Um, Romans uh, 16, 20. Romans chapter 16. And verse 20 says, And a God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Where is that? Where is the fulfillment of this verse fit in to the biblical uh, timeline? Well, that, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, we, I, my first call was May 21, you know, 2011. Yeah. But, uh, well, we know that um, here, here's what God says about Judgment Day and the wicked of the world. In Malachi chapter 4, um, it says in verse 3, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith Jehovah of hosts. And, and that would relate to May 21, 2011. God brought all the unsaved people of the world as well as Satan and, and the demons into judgment and uh, spiritually in a sense 
God's people who are going forth with the Bible's information, it's judgment day, the door is shut, and and so forth, and we're publishing these things, it's treading down the wicked as well as Satan, because we're, uh, we're also... We're we're also given information that um, that Satan has been put down and deposed and and uh, is under the judgment of God. But thank you for calling and bringing up that verse. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good evening, Chris and Mrs. McCann. Could we please look at Exodus chapter fifteen, verse six? Exodus 15, 6. Thy right hand, O Jehovah, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Jehovah, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Uh, my question is, is this <clears throat> telling us that, that the Lord was already at the right hand of God from the foundation of the world where he attested that he would ascend to at his earthly resurrection also. Well, yes. Yes, we know that um, that uh, the, the Bible is just full of verses that indicate that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And um, is it Psalm 110 uh, that says in verse 1, Jehovah said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And, and so uh, Christ um, has been seated at the right hand of God, uh, yes, since the time of his resurrection at the point of the world's foundation, when he was victorious himself over death, and the Father raised him up, and, and then he has been there um, throughout history, uh, as as God has worked out his salvation program in this world. Well, um this is this is something good, you know, to know because here in Moses or the the um, children of Israel and Moses are singing thy right hand. So maybe they're referring to the Lord Jesus Christ even though they don't know him as uh having come in the flesh, they call him thy right hand? Well, yes. Um, Moses knew Christ, but not, of course, as, as uh, he, he would be revealed. He didn't know him to that degree. But just as Abraham knew Christ, and, and Jesus said in um, John 8, before Abraham was, I am, or Actually, in that context, he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and, and saw it. And, and so Abraham saw Christ, or he saw the Messiah. He knew there, uh, there was a Savior and, and that he was saved by that Savior. And so did Moses. Moses um, was, was greatly blessed in receiving um, a great deal of revelation directly from God. And, and so um, all of God's people of the Old Testament, in a sense, as they were saved, saw Christ. And, and um, this is language, it, it's hidden language, and the uh, other parts of the Bible shed light on it, uh, but it's still language, yes, indicating the uh, victorious, Lord that is seated at the right hand of God. Well, Chris, uh, is it if if the words "Thou hast prepared for me a body" are spoken, you know, of the Lord Jesus Christ? So that did do you suppose he uh, actually, since Abraham saw him uh, the physical form of Melchizedek as well as the angels going to Sodom as men, and that is the person of God. Do you suppose that, that God um, created a body for the Lord Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world um, in which it was a perfect spiritual body? or And could he bleed and have blood? or how, how do you Well, think I don't know what kind of body 
he had, but he did have a body. It uh, when when he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, because uh, mm-hmm. God tells us that in Peter, uh, he he says in First Peter chapter two and verse twenty four, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And now, uh, it it says body, but it also says tree. And we know, um, because it's saying he bore our sins, that it was only from the foundation of the world that Christ was bearing sin and paying for sin. So it had to be then, and yet there was no trees. And and so the uh, reference to a tree actually can be understood when when we see that the Bible indicates who's ever hanged on a tree is cursed, and Christ was cursed from the foundation of the world, and, and, and therefore it's an equivalent um, idea that since he was cursed, it's as though he hung on a tree. And if that's the case with the tree, I'm not sure what God means by the body. He, he had a body, uh, it says here, and we do know that Melchizedek did appear in bodily form, and, and what theologians called theophanies occurred from time to time in the Old Testament. And, and so God's very capable of um, appearing with a body, and Christ uh, very well could have had a body in that sense, and and bore sin of all those that he um, he died for, and and then risen from the dead, and then later in history, uh, he he entered into the world through the Virgin Mary and was given uh, officially a human body, and he took human form, that which is a different matter than than, uh, say, Melchizedek, who was not born of a woman. Uh, it, it, we read in Hebrews, he's without father and without mother. And so Melchizedek was not as the Lord. It, it was a different kind of a body than the Lord would have in the sense that he, he did become flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, um, you know, I don't, is there a place in the Gospels where it says, uh, thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. It, it says that in Psalm 2. Well, it says it in this Hebrews day. chapter 1. It says in Hebrews 1, verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And And then in verse 6, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, the, the reference or the statement, this day I, have I begotten thee, uh, it's at the time that God um, now declares Jesus to be the Son. He is the first begotten from the dead, and, and therefore it is at the point of the world's foundation before the world was created. So there's no sun, no moon, no stars, no 24-hour day at, at all. But God says, this day have I begotten thee, because Christ is the essence of the gospel light. He's the, the essence of the day of salvation. And, and so when he rose from the dead, then everything necessary to send forth the gospel over the prolonged period of the day of salvation to save all of God's elect was uh, in place. All the works were finished. And this day have I begotten thee. It, it's as though uh, it think of it spiritually as a brilliant, bright, shining sun um, and now it shows itself as a, a day comes forth, and and yet 
It is that glorious light of the gospel is what God has in view. Don't don't think that it was some literal 24-hour day. But thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. All right, let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Um, in the study tonight, you said that Satan has been totally vanquished and um, that he has no longer any status. So how do we account then for all the terrible condition of the world it, that's, um, you know, where, where we are now, you know, from now until when we hope that the Lord will come in October. It, it's just so terrible. Yes. Think- yes, I, I know. Uh, it. Uh, on, on one hand, we uh, were, were sort of surprised to hear this, that Satan has been deposed, put down, and Christ has been exalted to rule. But the, the key is what it says in Revelation 19. It, it says in verse 15, speaking of the Lord Jesus, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. There God joins together the treading of the winepress, which we, um, we've we seen back in Revelation 14, is, is uh, the point in which the blood comes out and flows forth for 1,600 furlongs that identifies, uh, we, we strongly suspect with 1,600 days or, or the duration of Judgment Day. And, and it, it's not a coincidence that God says that Christ is ruling the nations with a rod of iron as he's treading the winepress or throughout the 1,600-day period. And, and that means that even though Christ has put down Satan, yet his rule is uh, a rule of wrath towards the unsafe people of the world. He's not ruling for their good or for uh, their benefit. He's ruling to destroy them, to, to smite them. And, and so God um, is allowing sin to continue, allowing uh, even for things to get worse in the church, in the world. Um, the, it, it's all a part of his judgment program. And Satan still exists, and, and Satan uh, can stir up things, and, and the fallen angels still exist, and, and they can stir up things, and men are still desperately wicked and unrepentant, and they're continuing on in their sin. That, that's actually part of the judgment uh, of the unsaved is there, God is not granting repentance. So men will naturally go deeper and deeper into sin. Um, I, how can I say this? I don't see the point in man having to go deeper and deeper into sin other than what you said some time ago um and if you could clarify this point one more time you had said something about the lord before the lord um destroys he allows sin to come into its fullness like um the case uh, just before the destruction of sodom and gomorrah as the case before the final closing of the door on the ark. So is that how... Well, well, yeah, just, just think of the church. God abandoned the church way back in 1988. And um, anyone who maybe was a part of the church, and some true believers were even within the congregations for a few years after. 
it, it, it was bad, but it's nowhere near as bad as it is today. It, and, and the judgment on the churches got progressively worse as the 23-year judgment period continued until today we uh, just just the churches are completely um a spiritual wreck it 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 there there is just uh it's incredible the degree that they've fallen and and the um depths of wickedness that they've continued in and that was god's judgment or part of his judgment was to allow them to stumble around in darkness like blind men and and to uh, the the further and the deeper they went away from truth and into their erroneous doctrines and and following the way of the world was further and greater judgment upon them likewise mankind now is is of the mind that marriage between two men or or a man and a man or a woman and a woman is actually a good thing and and it's a moral thing that nobody should be against can you imagine that 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 is actually the mindset and the belief the the genuine belief of a great many people in our time and it and that is a progression that is of a furthering uh movement into darkness and and uh same with with other ideas and uh, man is being hardened and uh, the darkness if it were possible is getting darker still and and that continuation or furtherance into spiritual darkness or spiritual blindness is a result and part of the judgment upon them. Well, that's pretty scary to think that um, there's, I mean, there's another like 10 months or so to go before our expected October 7th date. And it can get pretty, I mean, are we, it's scary to think how dark it'll become and is there any, how can I say, what comfort does a believer have that we're not going to be swallowed up by this darkness? Well, the, the uh, you know, God does give some encouragement to believers in times of darkness and the example of the Israelites in Egypt. There was a darkness that God brought upon Egypt. And such a darkness, he says, a thick darkness that it could be felt. And yet the Lord also makes a point of saying that the Israelites had light in their dwellings. And also there's that wonderful uh, couple of verses or verse in Micah where God speaks of darkness. Uh, and uh, he, he says... In Micah 7, in verse 8, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, Jehovah shall be a light unto me. I will bear the indignation of Jehovah because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness then she that is mine enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her which said unto me, Where is Jehovah thy God? Mine eyes shall behold her. Now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. And uh, there God uh, says that uh, the believers sit in darkness. And it, the, the Bible is indicating that today God has brought the world into a uh, very deep darkness immediately after the tribulation the sun is darkened the moon does not give its light the stars are fallen the door of heaven is shut the light of the gospel is out all over the world the world is brought into the condition of hell darkness and death 
and the believers are still here, yet we have light in our dwellings personally because the Holy Spirit indwells each child of God, and it's the Holy Spirit that enlightens the Word of God to us, and, and so the Bible can still be a light unto our feet and a guide to our steps leading us through this this dark period until the the day breaks and and uh, the uh, the the day of resurrection the coming up out of this world of darkness is is like coming up out of hell in a sense and it's a glorious um resurrection that that god has in store for his people oh but thank you so much for those words of encouragement thank you you're welcome thank you for calling and sharing and i would like to thank everyone for being with us tonight and sharing your questions and comments and especially the bible verses we had an opportunity to read and consider but we've come to the end of our time tonight so may you have a good night and may the lord's perfect will be done And thanks for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these Questions and Answers sessions Sunday afternoon following Sunday studies and Monday and Friday evenings following the Monday and Friday evening studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.